This is the fourth branch of Russell Dolag reporting. We have another great interview today. I'm here with Father Francis X. Hiesel, otherwise better known from his work with Mike Sem. How are you, Father? Good, very good. How are you people? Oh, we're doing great. Uh, we have a lot of stuff to go over today, so I hope you don't mind me being a little rushing you out too much. But, um, no, 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 no. Go right ahead. What's, why don't you start by um, just telling everyone a little bit about your story. Like, how did you first get out to Micronesia? Well, I came out to Micronesia in 1963. I came out because uh, I was reading a book at the site of the pool. In, uh, this is in the seminary. Uh, and this was the summer of 1962, and the book was about missionaries. And I said to myself, I think I could do that. So I wrote a letter to the provincial volunteering uh, for the Carolines because that was the mission of the Buffalo province, of which I was a member. So the provincial said, uh, well, uh, take a physical exam, and when you, uh, if you pass a physical exam, let me know. Well, I did pass a physical exam. I heard nothing from him for a couple months, and finally word came, you're elected, you're in. So I began uh, getting yearbooks, copies of yearbooks and so forth, and looking at the pictures of people and deciding that uh, Micronesians didn't smile very much, at least not when they were posing for pictures. Uh, was I wrong? Uh, but, uh, but I went anyway in 1963, and that's been the beginning of uh, what? It's almost... Uh, it's 40 some years, it's close to 50 years now, association, right? Oh, yeah. That's very, it's uh, been a wonderful time. Prodigious. Um, what were you doing when you, once you came out to Micronesia? I started off uh, teaching at Xavier High School for three years, went back to do my theology in the U.S., and then came back again in 1969. Uh, from 1969 until 1982, I was at Xavier. For most of those years, I was the uh, director of the school. Uh, remember, the principal and director were the same person up until that time. We split it off, so we got a principal, and uh, I was director from 1973 on, uh, 1973 to 1982. So uh, I was there. We were doing curriculum revision, and uh, I was teaching uh, a little bit of everything, really. And then after that? Well, actually, during that, uh, from 1971 on, I was working with uh, Micronesian Seminar. I mean, uh, let me put it this way, that um, in the uh, Conference of Jesuits, we, not just Jesuits, but church people get together. In those days, we got together about every two years. Uh, we had what we called the Vicariate Pastoral Planning Council. And we decided that, that we needed to put some time and resources into educating not just school kids, high school kids, but into the, into the community. So, we, uh, so what we did was uh, we decided, or they people there decided, that they would uh, create an organization that they called a Brand X. Uh, they didn't know what to name it. And uh, its job would be to raise issues uh, in front of the community, to get the community talking about economic and political and social issues. Uh, later on in that meeting, it was called Micronesian Seminar, and I was appointed the director, and I've been the director ever since then. I hope it's carried on its mission. I think it has. So uh, where are you right now, though, Father? Well, I'm in New York. I'm here on sabbatical. I was sent back on a sabbatical. And uh, I was, uh, it was supposed to be for a year. Um, I think, I mean, the impression I got was that I was supposed to come back this summer sometime. Now, unless that's been changed, that's what I'm expecting to do. I see. I don't know whether I'll go back to the old job at Mike Sem. I'm, I, uh, my understanding is that um, uh, there are, uh, the leadership of the Jesuits wants to do some transitional work at Mike Sem. I'm not sure what that involves. I'm not sure that any decisions have been made yet. And if they've been made, you know, I certainly haven't heard anything about them. I see. A big question raised on the internet is, what's the status of Mike Sem right now and what's going on with you? Oh, well, the status of Mike Sem right now is, uh, right, the status of Mike Sem right now is, uh, is something that uh, 
They have an interim director. There's uh, Father Joe Bellotti just went from Buffalo to take over for the next few months. And uh, he was once the director of PATS. Uh, he had that for four years. He worked in the Marshalls for a few years also. Uh, he is, uh, so he's supposed to uh, take care of the place for the next several months. And uh, what happens after that, I don't know. Uh, I know that people have suggested that, uh, that there be a, if there's going to be a transition, that first of all, the Jesuits decide, is this, why, is this do we have the resources any interest in continuing the work at Mike Sem. If we don't, then perhaps we should uh, turn it over to another NGO or organization that might have the interest in doing that. So it's uh, it's it's uh, that's what uh, what I know has been recommended to uh, to the people, but I haven't seen any decisions made yet, and I have seen no formal communications on this. So. What's being planned, I, I can't answer. See, well, thank you for that information. Uh, it's been a lot of whispers going around, people concerned that it was going to close down, that you're not coming back. But I guess uh, we got some good information. And some truth has been revealed to that effect. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this, that if it were up to me, I'd come back tomorrow. I mean, I'd have no problem. I'd have no problem getting myself on a plane to go back out there. Of course, we're all under superiors, you know, and it's, uh, if, if I'm given permission, I'll certainly go back, whether it's to continue working at Mike's M or to do some other kind of work. Um, I, uh, but as I said, I don't know what's, uh, what's going on right now. I think that uh, uh, with Mike Sim, what I've heard is that there's only one person still working there, and that's the uh, the photo archivist. This is uh, Carol Veras. Everybody else has quit or been laid off because of uh, money. And uh, the money problem, the money shortage, is because of the fact that there are no pr projects that were taken this year. So, of course, there's no inflow of money. So the library is still there, though, all those books and the library is still there and um, my understanding is again you know I've got no inside information but my understanding is that the um, that people uh, made the uh, a strong suggestion not to start uh, carting these things off to University of Guam or University of Hawaii or anything like that it's an organization that's grown organically and the resources there were uh, designed to assist the work in Mike Sem, whether that's in history or in uh, putting out issues of the Micronesian Council or whatever else it does. You see, Mike Sem should be seen, I think, as a primarily a community education uh, work. It doesn't necessarily have to be done in the form that we've done it with in past years. Actually, the form has, uh, has, has been transformed over, over time. I mean, once we used to do papers, uh, then we started the Micronesian Counselor, then we got into TV programs, then we got into radio programs. Mm. You see, it's, uh, we one time had uh, gatherings of people every month, uh, and then afterwards we, uh, we set up the forum discussions. So this evolves over time, the methods do. But the purpose should be the same, I think, which is to... Uh, give people an opportunity to discuss questions that are important and to stimulate them to do that. Well, I think you guys have been doing a lot to that effect uh, quite admirably and I think a lot of people are afraid to lose the resource of the library and that's why they've been asking that question because it's such a rich place of knowledge about Micronesia. Yeah, and I, I certainly want to see that uh, remain in Micronesia. You know, not carted off to, let's say, Hawaii or, frankly, not even Guam. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> uh, certainly not the Shamanat, huh? <laughs> All right, Father. <laughs> um, uh. In your time in Micronesia and at Mike Sam, uh, you've written a number of books and articles that have uh, appeared in journals. Um, which 
which of your works do you think was the most challenging to make to write? Uh, the first one. Well, not the first one actually, but the uh, the first taint of civilization. The first taint of civilization, because uh, uh, you know what what people don't appreciate is that uh, you have to work in a lot of different languages. Now there wasn't anything in the Micronesian languages, but you have to you have to work in Spanish. You have to do, you have to uh, be able to handle a little bit of German at least. Certainly, uh, certainly fr uh, French. Well, incidentally, French and Latin. Mm. You know, as far as of course English, uh, Japanese. I can't do much with. You know, we have to get uh, we have to work out a translation there. But it was challenging, not just because of the languages uh, in the source material, but it was challenging also because uh, I hadn't done anything like that before. I hadn't put together a full volume that was published commercially, University of Hawaii Press. And I wanted to make it as interesting as possible, uh, but I wanted to make it uh, uh, readable. I wanted it to be readable by people who weren't necessarily historians. And uh, that's what made it challenging. Well, what uh, what happened was what you see. And uh, <laughs> after that, the sequel came out. Taint 2, as they, uh, some of the people say, <laughs> or uh, the, uh, what was the name of the book? Strangers again? in Their yeah. Own Land. Strangers in Their Own Land, that's right. Yeah, good reading. Yeah, that's Took it. Me up yeah. That night. <laughs> yeah. Well, my brother said that, my brother said that the print should have been bigger. He would have gotten further in it. Among your many books and articles, do you know how many that are right now in the U.S. Library of Congress? Uh, you know, I hope all of them are, <laughs> because I, I I don't know about the ones that are done. You know, we we, we did a couple things. Charlie Reef Snyder and I. Charlie Reef Snyder was a Peace Corps volunteer back in the uh, late '60s and early '70s in Chu, and he and I uh, cut our teeth on a couple of social studies textbooks that are long since out of print. Um, I don't think that these are. I think we have a copy or two in the Mike Sem library, but that's, that's about it. Uh, but the other thing should be, anything is commercially published uh, from University of Hawaii Press and everything is picked up uh, for the Library of Congress. And even publications that are done by, say, the uh, Commonwealth of the Marianas Historic Preservation Office. Even those things go to the uh, uh, the Congress. So I'd say maybe about um, as far as books go, maybe about I hope about ten books. Uh, we're gonna move on to some questions about Micronesia. Mm -hmm. um, what changes would you like to see happen to Micronesia in the next fifteen years? Well, uh, the first thing is, uh, let me see, uh, political, social, and so forth. Uh, the first thing is, oop, I hope you're not. I hope you're ready to edit this thing because I, uh, <laughs> I got it's taking me a little trouble to get started here. That's okay, fine, let me fine. start. Let me start with the biggies. Okay, yeah. uh, the first thing is this: I, 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 I would like to see. And I'm I'm pushing for that here in a presentation that we're giving next uh, next next month in Washington on Pacific Island economies. I would like to see some rec uh, some recognition given by the U.S. and by Micronesians themselves to the fact that the uh, economic potential is limited in islands that are this small, this uh, uh, resource scarce and this uh, remote. So I'm, what I'm getting at is I would like to see a long-term agreement between the U.S. and Micronesia. Not Compact 2 or Compact 3 or Compact 4, but I'm talking about a long-term agreement because I think that the Pacific Island countries are going to need something like this in the future. You, you, you're saying something like uh, we should become a commonwealth or? No. I think that uh, I think you could remain an independent country, but I think that you could uh, you could keep this arrangement that uh, that exists now. The relationship with the U.S. is regarded as a foreign treaty, right. but it's a foreign treaty that brings in a promise of assistance. 
You know, what I'm just saying is uh, that assistance should be long-term, not short-term. Do you think uh, the U.S. is uh, readily wanting to agree to that kind of situation? Well, I think that the U.S. I think that the U.S. and financial institutions are being uh, are sometimes a little bit unrealistic in 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 uh, trying to figure out what island societies are capable of doing. I mean, uh, I've heard people say again and again, "Oh, any place can be Singapore or Switzerland." But I'm not so sure that that's true. Uh, there are certain things that you need, certain assets that, you, that are required to be a good tourist destination. Uh, I, it could be that FSM will become a good tourist destination in the future, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't put any big bets on it. Do you think the economical problems are a result of just there's nothing that we can make a lot of profit off, like tourism, like we're not ready for that? We don't have the infrastructure? Or is it well, like a cultural problem? No, I think it's, got, I think it's an economic problem. I think that, uh, see, a lot of people, <coughs> including former Xavier students, uh, seem to think that the problem is one of, uh, self-reliance problem is one of simply being able to feed oneself. But that's not the problem at all. I mean, I have no doubt that if push came to shove, the islands would be able to feed themselves and provide a certain amount of resources that they need, they would be able to get by. What they would not be able to do, however, is maintain the support of an expensive uh, modern government. Uh, an expensive modern government comes to about 125 or 150 million a year for FSM now. So what that means is that FSM has to provide a surplus a tax base that's big enough to generate 125 or 150 million a year, a year in taxes to support this modern government. What that means is you need a cash economy of uh, something like three quarters of a billion dollars. Eh. Yeah. See the problem? <laughs> Would you be a proponent of uh, making our government smaller? There's a limit as to how small it could be. I mean, I, I think it could be smaller than it is now. I mean, it's got uh, the, the big offender, I hope you don't mind me saying this, the big offender in this is Palau, you know, which has the, the most expensive government, you know, given its size. Uh, FSM is difficult because uh, you do need some kind of legislatures in these different places. Mm -hmm. They don't all have to be full-time legislatures, though. And they don't have to be as big as they are. You could save some things, but uh, you know you'd still have to pay the teachers and the policemen, and you'd have to pay the uh, postal employees and uh, and people like that. So uh, you could cut some expenses, but uh, I don't think you're going to get the cost of government down much below a hundred million a year. Well, well hopefully I could be wrong. <laughs> Hopefully we can figure something out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, could be wrong. Do you have any other big changes you'd like to see? Uh, is social changes, I think that, uh, you know, this may sound weird, but uh, I think that Mike and Isha seems to be handling the social changes pretty well. I mean, what I mean is that uh, they're not rushing to change things. You know, I think that, um, I, I think that, People should, they don't always do this, but they should look in both directions, forward and behind them, uh, before, they, uh, before they jump into a position. Uh, for instance, um, I think that women's groups sometimes, uh, in advocating positions, find themselves supporting positions that are um, more representative of the U.S and modern European societies than they are of island societies. Okay, let me give you an example. The example I often use is, um, is uh, family abuse, domestic violence. And um, I think that there's a lot of movement to get to call the police in to make an arrest early on. But do we really want that kind of confrontation? I mean, is this the best thing for families to uh, to call in the police uh, to do this sort of a thing, 
or do we want uh, a more amicable solution? Uh, remember, Micronesia, uh, uh, that uh, domestic violence wasn't unknown in the old days of Micronesia, but it was handled often enough by the brother of the woman coming in and with his baseball bat and, and uh, going after the husband. I mean, because families, you know as well as I do, that blood families still maintained a certain ownership over the women, even if they were married. Right. That wasn't a bad policy, you know? There's something to that. So, you, so I, th I think that uh, what I'm saying is that uh, we should look very carefully at uh, what we have right now and uh, how useful it is before jumping into uh, alternative strategies for dealing with problems. So what you're trying to say is like not so much um, change the way we've been doing things, but to try to look back at how we stand. Always, it. yes, always look back uh, as uh, just to uh, get a sense of what we've uh, left behind to see if any of it is useful. I'm not saying that uh, it's always the way to go. I'm not saying that, uh, I'm not saying that uh, it's always going to serve the purpose. But in some cases it will. And it's better to uh, know how this is being, uh, what resources we had in the past, than to be entirely ignorant of it and go charging forward into a solution that doesn't work or brings more problems than it solves. Is there any other kind of big changes you would like to see? Uh, let me see. Uh, the, the, the economic changes and so forth. Uh, uh, you know, not so much. Um, I don't... Oh, yeah, one change. One change that I think is critical. Very critical. I'd like to see people in the communities take a far more active interest in education at the primary and secondary level than they are right now. Because education is the key to the future, particularly in islands like this. Look at we're sending, uh, we're sending a couple thousand people a year to the U.S. to make their living there. Uh, education is going to count for something, isn't it? Uh, a, B holder. <laughs> And uh, MA, MA enrollee. <laughs> well, I, uh, I think it is. I think, it's, uh, I think it's a hugely important tool in the future. Well, you've been in Micronesia for about 40 years or more, right? What, yeah. What, what, what has been the greatest change that you've seen in that time, and why is that? Well, you know what I tell people? I mean, uh, I've, um, I tell people all the time and it comes down to family. I mean, I, I don't think that you can, I don't think that you can exaggerate the importance of a family thing. Let me put it this way. Uh, in my first years, I'd go down to the base sometimes and, uh, that's down to Tanook or down to, uh, Nebuchos or in one of those places in Chu. And I would walk back. We had to walk. There weren't many taxis in those days. In fact, there weren't any navigable roads to speak of. But uh, I'd walk back and I'd smell the cook fires in Penia, in Penia Sere. Always the cook fires at that time. Always the uh, the breadfruit being heated, the fish being cooked, or you know whatever it was. Always the big iron pots. That's what I noticed. The big iron pots and. Uh, because they weren't just feeding uh, four or six people, you know, it was feeding a whole a terrages, a whole lineage, you know, a group of houses. This is the way people worked. I mean, I saw people go out and pick breadfruit. People pick breadfruit now, I know, but it was done in larger groups. And uh, the larger groups made uh, uh, a more widespread cooperation possible. And it also protected people. Uh, oh, I don't know. I've written on this thing a few times and related it to one thing after another, related it to the suicide problem, um, related it to so many things that have, uh, that have happened, even domestic violence that we were talking about. The, the money economy 
has changed the shape of the family, and the shape of the family has changed about uh, 20 or 25 other things. It's That's the formula I'd use to describe it. I see. So this is one of those things that we should be uh, looking back to. It's one of those things that you're looking back to. You might not be able to recoup it, but remember, people are trying to do that already. Um, people in my family, even here in the States, get together to, uh, for a week in the summer in the mountains. It's extended family. All the Heasels and the people who married into the Heasel family uh, get together, 70, 80 people. And, you know, they're close friends. Um, I gather for a week to... Uh, uh, connect with one another. Well, the same sort of thing is happening in Micronesia, I think. That people are beginning to connect with one another, uh, uh, create holidays, uh, like January 1st, a lot of uh, Protestants in Chu were uh, regarding that as family day. And this was a day, even after the family was fractured, uh, when uh, the larger family, the extended family, would get together to celebrate the fact that they weren't uh, really a family. So that's a good idea. You know, it's recouping something from the past. It's not going to um, piece together once again, you know, that family that we had before, but it's going to, it's a step in the direction of recognizing the importance of what was once available, but has uh, passed away now perhaps inevitably. You've seen, I'm sure, so many amazing things in your time in Micronesia. Do you mind sharing two of your best memories of your time? Of amazing things? Anything. Your best memories of Micronesia. No, I've got many memories. It's amazing for you. What's, what's in your heart right now? i got many good memories of, of Micronesia. But it's... Uh, well, you know, I think of parties. I think of, uh, I think of times that we've gotten together. I think of, uh, you know, stories that we, we told. I think of one time at, um, one time in Pohnpei, we were doing the, um, uh, we were gathered around this uh, Christmas crib uh, lighting in December. And uh, there were about 20 of us sitting in a circle and we were telling stories about ourselves. This is about midnight or one o'clock in the morning. So uh, a few glasses of wine had been consumed, but uh, telling stories about uh, telling stories about ourselves, telling stories about when we uh, felt bad towards our families, and you know other revealing things, and and uh, that was one of the moments. Uh, there were other times. There was uh, there were times in uh, <laughs> there was uh, there was one time in Chuk when uh, I was staying in Faichuk, I was living in a little place, uh, Natutu, the mission center. And I walked with a couple uh, 10, 12 year old kids that I knew uh, to a distant village, met a Peace Corps volunteer there. Uh, this, this guy was a real character. Uh, he gave me, uh, he gave me um, a watermelon to bring back. The kids carried it back, and uh, when we got back to the house, I presented it to the sisters, uh, the MMB sisters there at, at the mission. They cut it open. It smelled bad, so they threw it away. When, uh, when I, I saw this Peace Corps volunteer the next time, I said, uh, I told him that uh, this, I gave the watermelon to the sisters. He asked me how I liked the watermelon. I said I gave it to the sisters, and they tossed it away. They said it was bad. So he clasped his hands to his head. He said, oh, no. I said, what's wrong? He said, I took a hypodermic needle and uh, put a whole uh, fifth of vodka in the watermelon. <laughs> so I lost. The sisters lost. He lost. You know, but it was that kind of thing. These goofy things that happen, you know, these uh, people trying to keep a tent over them on an, a picnic in an outer island, you know, in, not an outer island, one of the <laughs> reef islands trying to keep warm at night, huddling close to the fuss. There's so many of them, you know, they get, you could go on all day. Well, I'm glad you have so But I'm just reminiscing. <laughs> okay, Father, um, we got some uh, questions from our viewers. I'm going to be asking, I'll be asking them to you. Um, okay. This one is by Jerry Fagulimul via our oh, yeah, website. Oh, yeah, Jerry. 
Mm-hmm. He said, uh, what is your professional assessment of FSM as a nation to become strong in the long run or weaken in the long run as a result of political instability of Chuuk State and the nation national leadership who are, quote, hungry of political greed to be leaders? I mean, who, yeah. whom do you think will make a better president of the FSM when the new Congress will vote? Oh, I can't answer that question. I can't. Yeah, that's sticking my neck out too far. But I, uh, <laughs> I attempted to, but I, no, I better not. Uh, as far as the as far as the leadership goes, uh, yeah, there's too much. Um, there's. It's almost as if politics has become a form of entertainment in Micronesia. It's almost as if um, there are rules for politics that don't apply anyplace else in life. And uh, that politics has a little fence surrounding it. And that's too bad. You know, the whole idea was, was supposed to be that a person was representing the government, but of course, uh, the people. But of course, where does that really happen? That's the ideal. But uh, do you see it in African countries? Do you see it in Mid East countries? Do you see it even in many parts of the U.S.? Uh, so we, I guess we can't fault Micronesia too much or other Pacific Islands for not uh, achieving a perfection that uh, other places haven't been able to achieve either. Um, let's see. What else did you... Uh, there was one other kicker there. He said... Uh, oh, yeah. He was talking about Chuuk. Yeah. He said, uh, he said, what do you think about Chuuk? Well... Do you think... I. I it, it, yeah, I think the question is framed like, uh, do you think uh, Chuk is going to be bringing us down the, as a whole nation, that one state? Well, if I can be, I'm going to speak frankly, okay. but I'm going to f- speak frankly, assuming that people understand that I'm not bad-mouthing Chuk. Why should I bad-mouth Chuk? That's where I grew up, so to speak. Uh, I've got many friends there, and they're dear friends. But I do think that uh, the Chu can be oblivious to the fact, and I've talked to certain leaders there about this, they can be oblivious to the fact that, uh, that what they're doing is having an effect, and sometimes a negative effect, on the rest of FSM. By the same token, it doesn't help when other states start throwing rocks publicly at Chu. That should be done within closed doors, I think. It should be done, it should be done, uh, uh, sort of, yeah, within, you know, within, uh, well, with, within the structures that are set up uh, just for islanders. I mean, there's no need to advertise all this stuff in public, although a lot of Chuuk's problems are public, as a matter of fact. Um, I don't think that people understand how difficult it is for Chuuk to... Um, to achieve certain things that other states take for granted because of the system, because of the uh, cultural, political, or leadership system. The Chuk isn't a unified whole. You know, there may be people who believe this, but uh, I think it took me about three days there to figure that out. It's not at all a unified whole. Hmm. It's a very fragmented society it's a society in which um, it's a big man society. It's a society in which uh, there weren't paramount chiefs. There never were paramount chiefs. You know, there never will be paramount chiefs. I think. And uh, other places like Yap and Panape and Kushrai, who did have a, a more stratified chiefly system, have to recognize that Chu is not them. If the outer islands of Yap went independent. My prediction is you would see the same kind of thing happen in the outer islands that's happened in Chu, for the same reasons. Now, you can scold me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but I, uh, this is an opinion I hold, and uh, I'm willing to debate. Uh, you know, when you first started answering, you're saying, like, you were saying, don't take this as me bad-mouthing Chu. Do you think... Like, that's a problem within our islands? Like, it's hard to be critical of government? 
Yeah, it is. It's hard to be critical of anything because it's, uh, and that's why that's what make politics. That's what makes politics so difficult. Uh, <clears throat> we're supposed to be able to distinguish personal from professional. That's what Americans pride themselves on being able to do. Now it doesn't always work that way, but that's the ideal. Uh, remember the signs in Chuk you used to see uh, win news nunachuk. Uh, win, lose, you know, it doesn't make any difference, huh? Nah. Baloney. I mean, have you... <laughs> I mean, I've never met a candidate, you know, who's, who's lived up to that. You know, no matter what they protest on the, uh, the signs that are decorating taxis that are used to haul people to the polls on, uh, on balloting day. Um, I think that the... I think that the... Voting is taken very personally, as a matter of fact, and uh, you, uh, criticism of any kind is taken personally. And um, I have a chapter on that in this new book that I just did. But I don't think you're going to like the book. What's the book called? I don't, it's called Micronesia, A Cultural Introduction, and it's a short book. But it's a book on things like, uh, you know, what does a personal society mean, personalistic society mean? What does, um, uh, you know, what does it, how is information used? And why are Americans always uh, confused by information? Let me give you an example, okay, since we're starting, to, I, I'm not going to babble on and on, okay, but, uh, okay. Um, I, um, I, the first story I tell is that I'm sitting in the office and pick up the telephone when it rings. Somebody calls and says, uh, who is this? And every fiber in my American being says, you tell me who this is. You know, you're the guy who called me. I demand to know who you are. You shouldn't be asking this. This is a, this is a reversal of proper order. Now. Can you explain what's going on? I'm justifying myself from my American standpoint. You know, I'm picking up the phone and I'd like to know who this thing is, but this guy is asking me who I am. Why is he doing that? I'm not, uh, this is not a test question oh. or anything. <laughs> I was going to ask the, uh, the fourth branch there if they could figure out. No, I think he's doing it because he's trying to put people on a social map and figure out how to deal with them, you know? Yeah. If, this is, if this is a floor sweep, he deals with that person one way. If this, is, uh, this person is uh, a Chinese, then, you know, he might deal with them differently. If it's a, uh, if it's a bishop, you know that's uh, that demands another. You, know, you see what I mean? Right. That that always, always people need to be pinned to a social map. They need to have a face and a voice. They need to have an identity. That's the way things work in Micronesia. There's no such thing as impartiality. How can there be in a small island society? So I'm trying to explain things like that. Now, of course, this conflicts with the way Americans and modern nations do business. But might as well find out, identify the points of conflict, and find out why. And then uh, I'm not telling anybody how to solve these things. I'm just pointing out that uh, here's where you have a run-in. So anyway, that's what the book is about. When, when is it out yet? It's, uh, well, it's, I just sent it into UH Press. It depends on how quickly they work and whether they approve it and so on. All right, well, we'll be looking forward to that book. Okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah, but I don't think you're going to like it. <laughs> because it's going to be, it's a little bit too stereotypical. It's, um, it's not giving the particular cultural areas within Micronesia their due. It's just, you know, doing this whole thing, doing this this great big region known as Micronesia without any of the uh, uh, details, that, uh, living details that, uh, that it should have. I see. Well, let's move on to our next viewer question. This okay. is by Rechuk, from our, yeah. also from our website. When asked about the problems our nation is currently facing, one of our great leaders of the past predicted that the FSM will either fall before she rises in your personal opinion, is our nation still in the process of falling, or has she begun to rise? 
Well, there's a certain... Uh, I, th I, I worry about this a little bit, frankly. I worry about the fact that the, uh, the original vision, you know, the first generation of Micronesian leaders is uh, pretty much gone now. And um, I, I think this is to be expected in countries. Uh, does the second generation possess the same fire in the belly, the same passion? the same interest in, uh, in, in uh, carrying on their principles. I don't know, but I worry about that because uh, sometimes it seems that, uh, that that's, not, uh, that's not happening. I see. Our next question by Haas Rider, also from our website. What impact has organized religion had on the islanders, starting with the arrival of the Protestants around 1850? Considering the indigenous customs it changed and intrusiveness in other ways, in your objective opinion, has organized religion been a plus or a minus in the region? Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, let me tell you the story uh, the, uh, about a guy. This is a true story, by the way. The anthropologist who went down to Fiji and was talking to the chief and uh, lamenting the fact that the Christianity came in and changed things. And the chief said, listen to him for a while. And he shook his head and said, but uh, there's one thing that you don't appreciate. <clears throat> so the anthropologist said, what's that? And he said, if Christianity had to come in, you would be dinner tonight. <laughs> uh, well... <laughs> I mean, that was got that in the same similar fashion. Christianity is, uh, it did a couple things. First of all, it, uh, it limited, perhaps it didn't stop altogether, but it limited uh, violence, at least warfare between different islands or parts of islands. And uh, the second thing is, it gave uh, a coat hanger, <clears throat> no, that's not the right term. Um, it gave, uh, it, it, it was a, a unifying force in a place like Panape because um, even people from different ways, you know, people from, uh, oh, I don't know, Kichi and uh, Sokes and so forth, could relate to one another, even if they weren't from the same Penene, Kainak, and uh, Kainak, and so forth. Mm. They could relate to one another by virtue of the fact that they were Christian. And that gave them a, a relational uh, connection that I think was developed on later in the, uh, over the years. And that, that in itself was, uh, was important, I think. Also, I think it, uh, it helped because it, um, it, uh, it was an introduction to the modern world. Not just uh, not just iron tools and uh, bags of rice and so forth, but an introduction to the way of thinking of the modern world. It uh, it provided at least I think it provided you know some kind of an overview or philosophy for people to hold on to as they went through their uh, decades of modernization. So I think that those things were valuable features of uh, Christianity in the islands. So more of a plus than a minus for you. Well, of course. I mean, I can't do. I can't speak about that without bias. You know. I mean, that's <laughs> what I've been doing my whole life. But uh, I hope it was. A, I hope it was a plus. I. I think that. Um, I mean, there's, missionaries have made mistakes. I mean, I've written about my own, and um, I'm sure that anybody who came out here, either a Catholic, Protestant, or anything else. Uh, could do the same thing, you know, could point out mistake after mistake after mistake, things that we simply got wrong, or ways in which we underestimated the, uh, the cultural resources. But I think what we end up with is an appreciation for the, uh, the way the culture holds together. And this is another point I'm trying to bring out in this, this uh, book of mine, that there's a logic to uh, the, this culture. It's not just weird practices and so forth, you know. They hang together. They make sense if you look at them as a, as a whole. Um, 
And I think that uh, the Christian missionaries have come to realize this after a while. Uh, they've come to realize perhaps that they were a little tougher than they, uh, than they should have been, particularly on externals. But I think by the end of their life or the end of their career overseas, they begin to see that they've learned as much and their, uh, their faith has been improved as much by the people that they've worked with or the people they've worked for as the opposite way around. Um, that people who they serve, supposedly serve, are also the people who benefit them in their understanding of the faith, in their, uh, their relative sense of what's important and what's not so important in that faith. Well, Father, this is the last question I have. What do you personally want to be remembered as when uh, by the people of Micronesia? How do you want to be remembered? Well, I'd say two things. First of all, as a teacher, I said, uh, uh, I told somebody one time that uh, on my tombstone, if they had to put one thing, uh, he liked teaching and loved his students, although they did, although it didn't appear that way. <laughs> when he when he had them in class, something like that. The uh, the second thing is important. That the nicest compliment I've gotten from people is to say that uh, people were kind enough to say he has a Micronesian heart, and I think that's important. So that means more than uh, than just about anything. Well, you are a Micronesian at heart. So, amen. <laughs> amen. Well, <laughs> yeah. thank you very much, Father. Okay, uh, thank you too, Fourth Branch. This is another Fourth Branch interview brought to you by me, Russell Doleg. Once again, check out our website, fourthbranch.com. Check out our Facebook, Twitter us, subscribe to us on YouTube. All here, here, or here. Once again, thank you. Have a good one.